What is the meaning of life and the purpose of life under the sun? It's kind of interesting because the song that you just heard 100 years is by Five for Fighting. And the song was released on November 17, 2003. It was the first single from their third studio album entitled The Battle for Everything. The hit single reached number one on the U.S. Billboard Adult Contemporary Chart and number 28 on the Billboard Hot 100 and has since earned in the United States platinum status. The purpose or nature of the song is to demonstrate the preciousness of life and how we should soak in every moment and cherish all that we have. In an undersun world, because after all, you only have 100 years to live. It's interesting because when we look at this song, the first thing I want to tell you is this. If any of you are songwriters out there and you're wanting to aspire to make it to the Billboard 100, what I'm going to tell you is, is just take the words of Ecclesiastes, transform them, put them in a song, and I promise you that you will make Billboard 100. We've seen that with Kansas, all we are is dust in the wind. We've seen that with the birds, turn, turn, turn. And now we've seen it, obviously, with Five for Fighting, a beautiful song about 100 years to live. It's a wonderful song. It's a beautiful song about taking in and essentially soaking in every moment of life. But the reality of that is when we begin to really put it into true perspective, it's actually very depressing. Because what we notice is we're 45 for a moment, we're 67, it's gone, we're 99, and we're wishing what? For one more year. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm 99, if I'm 99, I'm not wishing for one more year. I'm wishing to go and be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the problem is, is in our world, so many people are living in an under the sun or apart from God perspective. And so this morning, we're going to continue on. And P.S., by the way, for those of you that were here last week and are now here again this week, I applaud you. Because, to be honest with you, when we look at the book of Ecclesiastes and we really begin to read it, it's quite depressing. And so... What I'm going to tell you is, as we examine this book again, let's get ready for another big dose of depression. <laughs> One of the things that I want to share with you, and particularly for those of you that are visiting this morning, there is an individual who is and was the wisest man that ever lived. The author and writer of this book has been attributed to Solomon. And earlier I have said that some individuals have come forward, they've begun to critique, and they've actually begun to say that perhaps Solomon is not the writer of this book. And the reason for that is linguistically, when you look at the Hebrew and the style of writing, it is too advanced for Solomon's time frame. But the retort to that that I give is, yes, it is. Because Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived apart from Jesus Christ. And so the reason that the writing is too advanced for the time is you're hearing it from someone who has been there, done it all, had it all, knows it all, has accomplished it all, has traveled every avenue of life, and has succeeded at it. But what he has done, he has entered into a sociological experiment. And he says, I'm going to try to discover the meaning of life. And he uses the words, under the sun. Those words, we have to remember, are basically a code language for life apart from God. Life without an eternal perspective. Life with just, we're here, we've got a hundred years to live, make the best of it, hope that it goes well, hopefully you enjoy it, and if you're lucky you get a hundred, but after that who knows what happens to you. So que sera, sera, live for the day, seize the moment, because all we are, as Kansas states, is dust in the wind. And so one of the things that we need to recognize is this is actually a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book when we are honest with ourselves and we begin to look at what the author is saying because it's an amazing apologetic. It's an amazing way to go to individuals and say, just take a minute and think about your life. Now please hear me. 
for all of you that are out there. Go, do, be, enjoy. Do the best that you can at whatever God puts your hand to. But what I'm also telling you is this. If you're living in this world with an under-the-sun perspective, if you're living in this world where this is all there is, if you are truly honest with yourself and you begin to examine your life, it's actually very depressing. Because in reality, as beautiful as that song is, we only have got a hundred years to live. If we're lucky... And just pause there for a minute. Because one of the things that's so important is we're naturally ingrained to think there's got to be something more. There's something inside of us that says there's got to be something more than just this quick tick of a life. And then I'm gone. But what's interesting is there's someone else out there that wants to say, don't think about that. Don't think about that. Let me distract you. Let me just tell you that life is all about pursuing pleasure, power, fame, recognition, resilience, making a name for yourself so that others will remember you. Will they? <laughs> One of the things that we have to remember is this. What is the meaning and purpose of life? Solomon starts off in the sociological experiment. And again, I've told you this before. Imagine yourself, you are at essentially a graduation speech, or you are at the state of the nation address. You are waiting for an individual known as the Kahotlet, the preacher, the master of the assemblies, to come forward and give you an address. And the title of his address is a question. What is the meaning and purpose of life? And you know that this individual isn't just some random individual. This is an individual who is the wealthiest, wisest, strongest, most intelligent man that the wisest of the wise of his day sought for information on how to go about living. This is the piece de resistance. This individual is going to come forward and he's going to tell you I've been there, I've done it all, I've seen it all, I've experienced it all, I know it all. P.S. by the way, I've written over 3,000 hymns and songs, and all of them are on the U.S. Billboard 100, for lack of a better word. And I'm here to tell you what the meaningful aspect of life is. Would you be interested? I don't know about you, but I would be waiting with bated breath to say, tell me, tell me, what is the meaning and purpose of life? I could not wait to hear him speak. I would go at great lengths to make sure that I was there. What is the meaning of life? And imagine if this individual stepped forward. How many of you would be like, shh? Quiet, quiet, quiet. I want to hear. I want to make sure that I get everything that this individual says. And so the place quiets down. Everybody's waiting with bated breath. What is he going to tell us? And he comes up and he says, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now, I don't know about you, but I think everybody there is going, we got to get a new speaker next year, right? Whoa! But if you're honest with yourself, if you really examine and you think, there's something that this person is saying, there is something in here that I need to pay attention to, because if he's coming forward, and this individual knows all, experienced it all, is saying it all, and he is giving advice. 
And his first words are, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And then he says, what does a man gain from all his labor at which he toils, key phrase, under the sun, apart from God, without an eternal perspective? And friends and brothers and sisters that have gathered here this morning, what I'm going to tell you is is when we truly examine life, what we begin to discover is the words of this individual are so utterly wise and so utterly profound. Because so many people in this world are searching for meaning and purpose and validity and hope in life, but they're doing so in an under-the-sun perspective. And so lovingly, what I want to tell you is this. Quit trying to figure it out. Read the book of Ecclesiastes in love. Because you will find your answer right here. You will find the answer that if you are trying to find meaning and purpose and validity and hope in life apart from God, you are going to discover that in the end, your life is utterly meaningless. Because after all, we only have 100 years to live. Let's turn. We're kind of right in the middle of a wonderful big dose of depression. Solomon has essentially stated his premise. He's moved forward. And what he is doing now is he is giving continual foundations to why he is saying that life is meaningless under the sun. And so he continues, and in verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 7, he's going to speak to wisdom. He's going to say, look, I'm going to give you some wise words, but what I'm also going to tell you is, in an under-the-sun, apart-from-God perspective, in reality, as, as best as I can give you, really what I'm kind of telling you is just do your best. Just do your best and hope it all goes well. Kind of keep your head down. Don't try to strive for too much. And just hope. Just hope you get maybe a decent life. And hope that maybe you get 100 years. Solomon writes, a good name is better than fine perfume. That's true, right? I don't know about you, but I hope I have a good name. I hope at the end of the day that my... Family legacy, when people think about me, it's a good name. But then he says this. He says that the day of death is better than the day of birth. I mean, if you look, obviously, on your bulletins, there's this, this striking contrast. And we all look to the baby, don't we? Oh, how cute. And it's cute. I'm not saying it isn't. It's beautiful. And then what do we do? Okay, I don't know about you, but we kind of maybe just here we go, oh, well, let's see. That's a much better picture, isn't it? What's this down here? I don't want to focus on that. But what Solomon is saying is, is in an under-sun perspective, your day of death is better than your day of birth. Really? Because when we break it down, when we look at the world, when we look at all of the oppression, all of the hurt, all of the pain, the sin that has entered the world, the hopelessness of mankind, the greed, the power, the desire for more, really, what Solomon is saying is, is, you know, to be honest with you, I just want to get through this thing and I just want to get out of here in an under-the-sun world. Just get me through don't know what happens to me afterwards. Just hope that I can get through, live my hundred years, if I'm lucky, and do my thing. It's better to go in the house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man. Now that's true. That's very wise. Think about that for a minute. Death is the destiny of every man. We are all going to die. We don't talk about it. We put it behind. We try to kind of stuff it away. 
But the reality, if we truly take an honest look at our life, unless Jesus returns, all of us are going to die. Those are very, very wise words. Sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. Solomon engages into this experiment where he says, I'm going to look at things and I'm going to examine them. I'm going to do the best I can with them to kind of contrast wisdom and folly, success and failure. And what he's going to do in an under-the-sun world is he's going to say, sure... For those of you traveling through the world, it's better to be wise, it's better to have wealth, it's better to have power. But in reality, in the end, if you're a fool, if you don't have wealth, if you don't have power, you all meet in the middle in a big old hole in the ground six feet under. And nobody remembers your name. And so Solomon starts off particularly in verses 1 and 2, and basically what he's saying here is, is in an under-the-sun, apart-from-God world, your day of death is better than your day of birth. Again, welcome to Faith Bible Church. So glad that you're worshiping with us today, right? But hear me in this. I've said this before. This is a central theme. I'm going to say it again, okay? 38 times. 38 times in this book, Solomon feels compelled to say that life apart from God is meaningless. It's a vapor or a mist. And so, just pause there for a minute. Life apart from God is meaningless. It's a vapor or a mist. And we listen to that song, which, by the way, I love that song. Okay? Great graduation song, okay? For those of you that might be graduating soon, put it in your, your thing, right? I mean, awesome. Makes you cry up. We only have 100 years to live, right? Really, life is just a vapor. It's a mist. without a perspective of eternity. And so Solomon is engaging in this, and he's forcing people to begin to look at something that they don't necessarily want to come face to face with, but desperately need to do. He's saying essentially, if you don't put God in the equation, it can be very, de very depressing. He is crying out and saying, you cannot find fulfillment, contentment, and peace without God. We cannot find the peace that passes all understanding in an under the sun, apart from God, non-eternal perspective world. And so, in wisdom, the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we want all that this world has to offer? Or do we want all that God has to offer through Christ? It really becomes that big of an issue. Go, be, do, have an amazing world. I pray that all of you are blessed and have a wonderful life. But what I'm going to tell you as a pastor of 20 years, that simply is not true. There's hurt, there's pain, there's loss, there's foil, there's folly, there's sin in the world. And so while I pray that all of your lives are blessed, while I pray that you get all of the presents that you get at Christmas... Some of you won't. And so offering this world of hope apart from God is the greatest folly of all. And so Solomon is engaging and he basically is saying, look, 
Do you want all that this world has to offer or do you want all that, the, that Christ has to offer to you? And then he continues on after verses 1 and 2 where we just kind of get in and he's basically saying, you know, in this world it's better to die than to be born. He then continues on and he says, therefore... The, in the vanity of this under-the-sun world, just try to make the best out of a bad situation. That's essentially the logic and the wisdom that Solomon is giving in verses 3 through 24. Just, just do your best. Just, just try to get through. Try to enjoy. Try to eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you die. But don't think about that. Solomon continues on in verse 7, extortion turns a wise man into a fool, a bribe corrupts the heart. How many times do we see individuals be corrupted through a bribe? It shouldn't surprise us. It's sad. But that's just Life in an under-the-sun world. The end of the matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. That's true in an under-the-sun world. Just keep moving. Do your thing. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. And then I love this one, right? Verse 10. Do not say... Why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. I find verse 10 of chapter 7 so fascinating because essentially what Solomon is saying in an under-the-sun worldview that has no eternal perspective is that there's a tendency for us to romanticize the past or live in the good old days. How many of us do that? Right? Right? Now, I love reunions. I love going back and seeing friends. In fact, here in a couple of weeks, I'm going back to Philly to see a couple of buddies of mine. Going back to my old alma mater. I haven't been there for 30 years. We're going to go watch Lafayette play Holy Cross. It's fun to reminisce. The good old days. And I'm so excited to go see my friends. I'm so excited to go spend time with them. But I'm a very, very different man than what I was in college. To be honest with you, I would not have been in this pulpit if you saw who I was back in college in an under-the-sun, apart-from-God perspective. But what we do is as we see the clock ticking, as we move closer and closer to this end, which we all know is coming... We try to back up and live in the past, which there's nothing wrong with it. But what he's saying is you can't just stay there because the clock still ticks forward. We attempt to fill them in with remember when statements? Remember when we were here? Remember when we did this? To be honest with you, when I'm with a couple of the guys, I'm going to be like, yeah, I remember that. And boy, I love you guys, but I kind of want to forget that time. We move forward trying to find the meaning of life. And please hear me. I just, I I have to share this with you. If you are living your life in an under the sun, apart from God world, all you are doing is grasping at air. You are grasping for something that simply is not there.
What Solomon is driving at, essentially where he is going, he says, I'm going to confront this. And I'm going to tell you that this too is vanity. So just in an under the sun world, do the best that you can to get through this meaningless and pointless life under the sun. Just get through it. Verse 11, wisdom is like an inheritance that a good thing. It benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. That's definitely true. That's good wisdom. If you're wise and you have money and you're wise in investing it, sure, you might have a better life. But he also says, even though you might have a better life, the reality is you're still going to be six feet under. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? Okay? Now, remember, Solomon is acknowledging a God, but he is not acknowledging in this study a relationship with the Creator. He is viewing the world in an under the sun, apart from God. There's somebody out there. There's this thing that's out there, but I don't have a relationship with him. When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, consider God has made one as well as the other. That's, that's true, right? But think about this. How many people with a non-heavenly perspective throw out that, well, you know, God must give good days and God must give bad days. Tomorrow will be better. But their mentality is there's no eternal understanding of their destiny with Jesus Christ. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. Right? How many people live in the world in an under-the-sun perspective, apart from God, thinking about this cloud in the sky where everybody goes, and when they die, they sit on a cloud and they strum harps? Can I tell you something? If that's what I'm going to do in heaven, I don't want to go there for eternity. of you are annoyed right now. Okay? And that's only 30 seconds. Okay? Here's my point. Okay? I am all about heaven. I cannot wait to go see my creator. But the reality is, is so many people think that we're just going to live this life. We're not sure what happens to us. We think perhaps maybe we go up. Maybe we're with God, but we're not 100% sure. We're not really sure what happens when we die. So we're just going to kind of live our life for the here and the now. Verse 15, In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, a righteous man perishing in his righteousness, a wicked man living long in his wickedness. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Haven't we seen individuals living righteously or trying to and perishing in their righteousness? Dr. Martin Luther King, for example. And we see wicked individuals getting away with, and I'll use the quotes, murder. Why? Because we live in an under-the-sun world. Don't be over-righteous, neither over-wise. Why destroy yourself? How many times have you seen someone, right, essentially work and have effort and move forward and do something and either they become known, right, they become powerful, and the moment that they become powerful, what happens? The world begins to attack them because they've risen, right? 
So Solomon is just saying, basically, you know what? The best advice I can give you is just keep your head down. Don't be over wicked, and don't be a fool, right? Why die before your time? That's decent advice in an under-the-sun world. It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who feels God, okay, will avoid all extremes. Now, here's what's interesting about this. In this moment, again, Solomon is still writing from an under-the-sun, apart-from-God perspective. Basically what he's saying here is fearing God is revering him, but not in a relationship with an internal understanding. He's saying, as I look at the world, you're probably better off to try to do things according to what God would say. Religion, but not relationship. That's what he's saying right here. And so many people say, yeah, sure, you know. Don't know really why we're here, don't know my purpose in life, I don't know what Christ has done for me on the cross, but what I'll tell you is I think there's something out there and it's maybe the Bible, and so just kind of, you know, obey the Ten Commandments and you're okay. Right? Go to church, which is great. Honestly, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. I mean, this is important. Thank you for making the effort to come to church. But I'm going to lovingly tell you that church is not going to bring about an eternal destiny for you. Sitting here today is not going to bring about an eternal destiny for you. Although it's wonderful, I praise you for coming. What is going to bring about an eternal destiny for you is to examine the meaningless of life and realize that the true purpose and meaningful aspect of life is found in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Solomon continues on, and if you just kind of want to read through these verses, essentially, again, the premise that he's making all the way up into verse 24 is... Just do the best you can in a bad situation. And then in verses 25 through 29, right? He kind of moves into this concept. He begins to recognize something. And what he's saying here is, in the end, in an under the sun, apart from God world, we're all just worthless sinners. It's so interesting because here Solomon is giving the reality of who we are in a broken, fallen, and what? Sin-cursed world. I've said before, Sigmund Freud... Okay? One of the founding individuals that all of modern psychology is built upon. His founding premise as he examined the human condition was this. We're all just a bunch of trash. And so Solomon comes in and he says, so I turn my mind to understand, to investigate and to search out wisdom in the scheme of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and madness of folly. Why is all of this the way that it is? Right? Why do bad things happen to good people and bad people get good things? Why do we drive on a parkway and park in a driveway. And I find more bitter than death the woman is a snare whose heart is a trap and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. This is such an interesting moment. And ladies, please don't take offense at this. 
Solomon isn't saying that, that men are good and women are bad. If we know Solomon, what we know about him is, is he had hundreds of wives and hundreds of concubines. And while not going into too much detail, I think we know where that leads. He was a womanizer. And what he's looking at and what he's discovering is that until he sees the real beauty of relationship with a wonderful woman in his life who he loves and cherishes, who is his via the joy and the sanctity of a holy marriage. All they are is an ensnarement to him. Basically what he's saying is, is guys, here's what I'm going to tell you. Every beer commercial out there is going to tell you that when you have beer, you're going to get women. I've seen it, I've done it, and I know it, and I'm telling you that it isn't worth it at all. What's worth it is honoring and cherishing the woman that God gives you because she is a gift. That's wisdom. And then he turns and he says, Look, says the teacher, this is what I've discovered. Adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things. While I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. Why? Because he's not looking for a relationship. He's looking for, and I'll just leave it, as we all know where it is. This only I have found. God made mankind upright. He's going back to Genesis. He's going back to creation. He's going back to the remembrance of when God created the world. Each time, each day, in what he created, he said it was good. But if we pay attention... When God made man, he says it was and is very good. And we lived in a garden, and we had it all. And God loves us, and God gave us all that we could ever want or have. Just don't eat from the tree. What did we do? We ate from the tree. And we all like to say, I didn't eat from the tree, Eve did. And then the ladies say, well, what about Adam? And the guys say, well, Adam didn't do it, right? And sure did. Adam was supposed to protect Eve. Adam was supposed to say, that's not what we should do. Adam looks at Eve and says, hey, go ahead, eat from that. Let's see what happens to you. Because if you eat from that tree and God strikes you down, then okay, I'm a little bit wiser. I'll just wait to see what happens to you. But if you eat from the tree and you are wise, then I'll eat from it too. So I'm using you. Go, go. Get in there, Eve. Let's see what happens. When the call of Adam was to protect and cherish and admonish Eve. And so what happens? Well, right here. But men have gone in search of many schemes. There's got to be more out there than what you've given to me, God, because I want to be you. You're holding out on me, God. There's got to be more. What you have given isn't enough.
so interesting because as we travel through these four verses, I find them so compelling. In his under the sun premise, Solomon is saying, yes, there is a God and we have rebelled against him. So we deserve our lot. The vanity of this life which is under the sun. And to be honest with you, this is entirely true apart from Jesus Christ. Yet to quote J.C. Ryle, Christ is never fully valued until sin is clearly seen. Right here he's giving a hint. Right here he is causing people to look at it and say, you know what, as we examine this world, as we see what's going on in an under the sun perspective, we are beginning to recognize that sin is in this world and it's not a good thing. But I don't know what to do about it in an under the sun, apart from God, non-eternal perspective. And so friends, the reason that I love the book of Ecclesiastes is this exact statement right here. Christ is never fully valued until sin is clearly seen. We have to know the depth and the malignity of our disease in order to truly appreciate the great physician. Christ didn't die to make good people better. Christ didn't die to make your life the way that you want it, how you want it, and to let you have what you want from Him. Christ died to make dead people alive. Christ died to make a meaningless, empty vapor of a life something that it is not all there is. Christ died to give you eternal life. So yes, well, on this world, you might have a hundred years to live. When you draw your last breath on this earth, if you're lucky to make a hundred years, you will draw your first breath in eternity where there is no time or concern. And so as you look at the book, as you look at Ecclesiastes, it's an uncomfortable book. I can see it in your faces. It's an uncomfortable book to preach in some ways, but it's a beautiful book if you really look at it face to face and begin to realize the wisdom that is given because what it does is it drives us away from a passion for this world and it drives us toward a passion for our Savior. And then we turn to chapter 8 and we're like, please come. I promise it gets better. <laughs> I do, okay? Please hang in there with me, right? I promise it gets better. But sometimes, trudging through the hard, trudging through the uncomfortable, trudging through the examination of life apart from God is exactly what we need to do to where on the other side, when we come across that and we see our relationship with Christ, we can say, thank you, O God, that my life is not just a hundred years to live. Do you see that? Oh, how much more we appreciate our life with Christ when we truly see how meaningless life is apart from Him. And then we get into this wonderful part of chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. And friends, what I'm going to tell you right here is these are, these are hard words to hear, but it is so true in our world and it explains so much about the wickedness that we see. Solomon continues on and he says, Who is like the wise man? Who knows the explanation of things? Wisdom brightens a man's face and changes his heart appearance. That is definitely true. And then he gets into these wise words and he says, Obey the king's command. I say because you took an oath before God in an under the sun world. Do 
Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Think about this for a minute. I love this in the sense of it explains so much about our world. If you doubt what Solomon is saying, take a long, hard look at verse 4 of chapter 8. In an under-the-sun world, Solomon is saying, my advice to you, no matter how evil the ruler's intentions and actions are, keep your mouth shut. Don't disobey the king. No matter how crazy you think he is, keep your mouth shut because if you say something, what's going to happen to you? Not going to be good. No wonder dictators like Stalin, Hitler, and Mussolini got away with the murder of millions. Not just millions. Stalin was responsible for an estimated 3.3 to 20 million deaths. And friends, what I'm going to tell you as someone who was an international affairs major stuttering the history and the political movement of Stalin, I'm going to say that those estimates are way on the higher side than they are on the lower. Hitler was responsible for the death of 6 million Jews and up to 14 million others. And this is just in Europe during World War II. What about Mao Zedong, Idi Amin, Tojoko Hideki, and others? It is a full explanation of the world that we live in under the sun. Solomon is saying essentially in this vain, undersun, apart from God world, keep your head down and just obey the king. Just do your thing. And then he moves on to chapter, uh, to verse 10 and 13 of chapter 8. And what he's doing is he's saying somehow some way in this under the sun world, I have to trust that there's going to be some form of justice in fearing God and retribution of the wicked. Now, here's what's interesting about this. He is moving in a perspective apart from God. Okay? Do you see the difference? He's saying, I can't promise it. I can't promise that there's going to be a day of reckoning, reckoning, a day of judgment, a day of restoration. I just have to trust that somehow, some way, in this crazy, wicked world where I see so much injustice, that somehow, maybe, I hope, but I'm not sure, God's going to figure it out. What do we know about our lives in Jesus Christ? We know that there is a day that is coming. We know that there is a day when God will set all things new. We know that there is a day where God will repay the righteous and he will bring about what? Just to the wicked. It's coming. It's there. It's promised in Scripture with an eternal, non-under-the-sun perspective. You see the difference? Solomon says, basically in verse 10, Then I too, I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. When the sentence for crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes do wrong. Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with a God-fearing man who are, rever who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. I hope.
And then in the final verses, after kind of saying, I hope that there's some form of justice, Solomon says, let me just give you one more word of advice. Just stay busy, be content, and certainly don't ask questions in and under the sun world. Just keep your head down. There's something else, verse 14, meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life. Just eat, drink, and be merry. In an under the sun world. Because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat, drink, and be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of the life God has given him under the sun. For we only have a hundred years to live. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe a man's labor on earth, his eyes not seeing uh, sleep day or night, when I saw all that God has done, no one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all this, efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. I've tried, I've done it, I've sought, I've looked, I've experienced, I've tried to get what is the meaning of life. And I can't find it under the sun. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. Basically, what Solomon is saying there is quit throwing out a bunch of lies. Oh, I'll tell you what the meaning of life is. Come follow me. The meaning of life is to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And if you follow me, I'll give you five steps to how to be healthy. I'll give you five steps to how to be wealthy. And I'll give you five steps to how to be wise. And everybody comes along and says, boom, this is the wisest person on earth until the next person comes forward and says, I'll tell you how to be wealthy, healthy, and wise, and I'll do it in four steps. And then they'll say, I'll take your four and I'll raise your sum. I'll take it in three. And everybody says, what's the quick way to do this? And everybody follows along thinking that in some way they're going to figure out the meaning of life. And so Solomon comes forward and he says, don't fall for the game. We've examined, we've looked what is the meaning of and purpose of life under the sun. And to be honest with you, I'm really looking forward to moving forward in this book for some more exciting things. But if we examine this truthfully, we begin to realize that life apart from God is meaningless. And so what I want to leave you with this morning is simply this. Life under the sun, we've built upon this apart from God. It's meaningless, it's empty, it's vanity. Apart from God. But with God, it is whole, it is fruitful, it is fulfilling. And so going back to this idea, this quote by J.C. Ryle saying, look, until we really understand the depth of our sin, the vanity of life, we cannot truly appreciate the great physician who's come to fix it all. And so lovingly, what I would say is may we humble ourselves and acknowledge our need for a Savior. That's what Solomon's driving at here. What's our natural tendency is this prideful idea of there's got to be meaning in life. You can't come forward and tell me that all I've done is meaningless. You can't tell me that the things that I've worked on are meaningless. They're wonderful. But what I'm also telling you is 
At the end of the day, after 100 years, it's meaningless if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Nobody's going to remember your name. Nobody's going to remember your resume. Nobody's going to remember what you've done. I've said it before. How many of you remember the names of your great, great, great grandparents? Anybody? Case in point. But who will remember you? Who will remember you on that day which is coming where you will draw your last breath and close your eyes and you will depart from this world? I know who will remember me. My Savior, Jesus Christ. He will reach down and say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come, take my hand and join me in the banquet feast of life that will never end. And he will do that for you too, for all who have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so lovingly, heartfelt, I come before you today. And what I want to tell you is this, the meaning and the purpose of life, as beautiful as it is, as wonderful as it is, as much as I love my family, as much as I enjoy my wife, as much as I love my kids, as much as I hope that on that last day, as I've said a hundred times before, I'm skiing down the Hobax in Jackson and God takes me into glory. The real meaning of life is to know our Savior, Jesus. How do we know our Savior, Jesus? Friends, brothers and sisters that have gathered here, the joy of the gospel, the blessing of the gospel is this, that in the utter meaningless of life, in the vanity of life, in the non-purposefulness of life, there is a creator who has made the heavens and the earth, and yet he has also made you. And Psalm 139 says, you're not just a haphazard wreck of a person. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are God's masterpiece. And God says, I value you. To give you my son. To die on a cross. To suffer. To go through anguish, as we've discovered in these past sermons. Not just physically, but mentally. For you. That's how much I value you. And so come, take my hand. Come and just say, you know what? God, you're right. This world apart from you is meaningless. And I want you in my life. How do I do that? You just come and you say, God, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that this life apart from you is just dust in the wind. And when you do, this is, the, this is the, the thing that I love about this. God doesn't sit you down and say, let me see your resume. Let's see if you qualify. Let's see if you actually can come to my holiness. Give me the top 10 reasons why I should let you into my kingdom, oh peasant. He says, come my child. For I have waited for you. I have longed for you. I have given my son for you. I'm so glad you're home. Let me show you the banquet feast. Come and dwell with me throughout eternity. For we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. 
And so may you come and take the hand of our Savior and find the true meaning and purpose of life, which is to know God and have a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Father, we come and I just pray. I pray that these words of Solomon, as hard as they might be to hear, hit home. They really cause us to begin to think about why am I here? What is the real meaning behind life? And Father, I pray that sort of in this uncomfortable sort of squirming way, that we would look, and as we try to say, well, to say, well, maybe there's meaning here, maybe there's purpose there. As I said before, that as we go in that direction, Lord, you would just continue to gently but forcefully remind us and say, you're going the wrong way. You're pursuing vanity. You're pursuing a mist. You're pursuing a vapor. And Father, thank you for your patience. Thank you that you are loving and merciful and slow to anger, a good, gentle, and kind God. Who says, come to me. Come to me and you will find life. Not only will you find life, but you will find life in full. Father, I pray that for those of us that are in Christ, this would be an exaltation, an encouragement to us to say, God, thank you so much for the life that you have given us. Father, may we go and may we use it for your honor and your glory. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. And Father, if there's anyone here who, maybe this is the first time they're hearing the message of the gospel. Maybe they've heard it before and they've been trying to find meaning in their life. I pray that, Lord, in your way, that as I plant and as I water, you would take that. You would take those seeds And you would grow them in this individual's heart to come to know the one and only true God who brings life and purpose to our eternal being. Jesus. We thank you. We love you. And Lord, we only got a hundred years to live but we have an eternity with you. Amen.